I was going to come back and be a better player. That was the plan. I mean, it wasn't a plan to be a worse player. To what extent do you feel you maximized your potential? That's difficult to say. I'd say probably 90%. You know, I mean, I didn't reach my potential, but it's very difficult to reach your potential. I think I did better than most people. When I took time off, six months off or so, when, which doesn't seem like a crazy amount of time now, Roger Federer, um, that uh, I was coming back to be a better player. I didn't, you know, I wasn't, you know, parents thought, oh, he's going to quit, or some people thought, was, no, I was going to come back and be a better player. That was the plan. I mean, it wasn't a plan to be a worse player. And I tried a whole set of things, whether it was, you know, weightlifting, you know, yoga, training more off court, getting back to playing a little bit more, uh, changing, trying different racket, whatever it was, anything and everything. At the time, if you look at where I was at, say, the end of 1984, 1985, I'm, I, I did feel at that particular stage that I thought to myself, and that maybe it sounds egotistical, but, and I guess it is, when I was at that stage, I thought no one's ever played you know, better than I played. You know, when I'm at my best, I feel like I'm the best that's played. I brought the game up to a different level. Um, but why aren't I feeling better about it? So I felt like something was missing uh, in my life. It wasn't the tennis part. So because of that other part, probably ultimately my tennis was hurt. You wrote in your book, for anyone who's been on the top, once you've lost it, everything spirals out of control and it's difficult to find your way back. Explain that. Well, you know, some of this is you rely on instinct and some of it is luck and some of it is a lot of hard work, but at the same time, you work for many years to maintain that edge and any athlete will tell you that you don't want to lose it once you get there because you've spent years, you know, with every part of the sport, the mental part, the preparation, the intensity, the playing, all that to come to a point where you've got an edge. And when you take time off, and if you come back and clearly something, look, look at Novak right now, you know, people are like, well, what's gonna happen with Novak? No one knows. Right now, he's a shell of a person he was. Tiger Woods, you know, he was gonna break Jack Nicklaus's record, no question about it. Well, five years have gone by, and you know, you're like, he's a shell of himself, and you know, maybe a lot of it's injuries or a combination, and now he's has a chance again. And so you don't, you, and, and Novak could have a chance again, absolutely. And I don't think I was ever counted out. I, my last Wimbledon, I got to the semis. Uh, I played Sampras in the semis of the Open when I was 31. I thought to myself, all right, I got, I got this. You know, he, he's 19. Now, he was, Turns out he's a, turned out to be a pretty good player. And Agassi in the final. Now, I could have lost to him, I guess, too, because I lost to him at Wimbledon. But that seemed like it was going to happen. Um, and it didn't. So it's, <laughs> I wish I knew the answers to these. The, the end of your tennis career, per se, was also basically the end of your marriage. And you wrote, I felt as though the bottom had dropped out of the world. How would you describe the feeling? Not only was I losing a part of my identity, which was tennis, I or so I thought. Um, it turns out I'm still obviously m a lot more involved than I thought I would be at the time. Um, what I basically thought I was stopping for in a way was so that I'd allow my ex-wife to sort of have the opportunity to go out and do her thing and then take care of the kids, which I thought, hey, that's not a bad thing. They're young and that would be a good thing. So then to have sort of neither one of those in a way, like the end of the marriage and the career, that was, you know, that was a lot to handle. That seemed a bit overwhelming. Do you remember why you were crying on the changeovers in Paris? It just was too, I, did, I shouldn't have been on the court. I felt like I was sort of obligated to sort of finish, I mean, I guess I didn't have to. I guess I was lucky in a way that there, I played with my brother, so I, you know, I had some support system. Patrick was with me. Um, Davis Cup meant a lot to me around that time uh, because I was around people that were supporting me and my kids were there. And so I was g least getting by by the skin of my teeth. With regards to Patrick specifically, uh, you said what saved my life in Paris was the presence of Patrick. Um, what do you mean, save your life? Having Patrick playing doubles 
and just being around him was very um, was very helpful to get me through. You know, I had some good, strong support. Um, I was with Andre, I remember, the week before Davis Cup, and he was trying to help me through things. And uh, the team and Davis Cup, that meant a lot. You know, Pete was there, and he said he loved me, you know, and on the, when we won the double. So that, you know, that I'm sure that I'm, I think it's safe to say that that's the only time he's ever said that to another player on a tennis court. I love you. I love you, man. But that meant a lot to me. He probably won't even admit he said it now. Um, hopefully he will. But that was, you know, just having your sort of tennis family around at that time was, was very important.